thanks so much for doing this. I'm so excited and such, such short notice as well. Really, really appreciate your time this evening. Thanks, guys. Oh, no, honestly, thank you. Like, we're over the moon. It's like, we were like, oh, I've not been excited about anything this year. I was like, James, only two days in. <laughs> it's like, it's this <laughs> like, it's I'll good. take that it's as terrible. a compliment, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, listen, yeah. congratulations on on Jack Daw. It's, um, I loved it. I think um, so many things I want to talk to you about it and so many things I, I really enjoyed about it. The music, obviously, a very big part of that. And I know that the conversation and the, the atmosphere that music creates is a, is was was worked on with a pair of you way before anything was shot as well. So we'll get to that in a second. But there's something really wonderful, Jamie, about how you are kind of celebrating small towns and the creativity and the stories that can come out of small towns. I think that that's kind of, you know, I love the fact that coming from a little fishing village on the east coast of Scotland, you know, I think they've been able to tell kind of, small stories that have a universal appeal or a universal connection is a wonderful thing. And I think what you've done with Jack does, you've opened up a door, I think, for so many people to to tell stories, really. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was such a big part of it for me. It, as much as anything else, to, to try and get a first feature made, um, you know, working in TV and high in TV dramas and stuff for a while, but to go back to try and make something humble, but with a bit more production value than, you know, I might have done a few years ago if I'd just done a sort of a low budget indie before I'd got into doing TV stuff and obviously borrowed a lot of the skills that I'd learned from doing these like high end American things. Um, but I've always wanted to take that back to the town where I come from, you know, and I'm very much, I've, got, I've still got a house in the Northeast. I live there. Uh, I actually, I still live in the town. I literally shot this film out the front of my house and I wrote it looking out <laughs> my window of my house. So it was, you know, to go back there and we're really trying to like build a film industry there and stuff at the moment. Yeah. There's like bits and bobs of it. So the big goal for this was to sort of kick that off a little bit. And, you know, that was such a huge part of making this film for us. Was your, I believe your granddad's house as well was a location. I love that. It's like, you know, everybody mucking in, helping out. Yeah, so that was the first day of the shoot. He, we used we used his house and uh, we used his band's music in the in the film as well. So, yeah, so if we, he's he's well and truly included in this movie. <laughs> you you mentioned kind of you know sitting at your at your window and the, and and the sea. Um, and there's something about the sea, I think, in terms of the, I mean, sonically, but kind of how with every blink of the eye, it's a different landscape almost in a way. You know, in terms of tidily and, and all that kind of stuff and weather and stuff it, it was really lovely to hear you talk about how inspiring that was for you initially when you were sitting down writing this story and these characters mm. yeah I mean going back going again back to my granddad like he's a deep sea diver north sea fisherman so it's like we've always grew up around you know that kind of environment it's been such and I think the north sea specifically as well for me is like a, such a like an atmospheric beast that like mm -hmm. has so many stories to tell and especially in like that region of the northeast and you know east coast of scotland and northumbria like has this kind of rich folk ta tapestry you know and i always thought i'd probably end up making like a folk tale and i suppose in some ways i have but in a sort of like a, a slightly different angle than just like a traditional folk story but um yeah the sea is a big part of that story and that's like kind of you know and i knew that jackdaw would have this mixture of pastoral and industrial and that's kind yeah. of like the feminine and the masculine that affects that character and like the choices he makes so those yeah the sea being a big part of it and and the landscapes he travels travels through you know and that being the main one i was only just swimming in the north sea five days ago uh, oh well yeah <laughs> yeah my mum goes in about three four times a week with our with our uh, wrongins as they call themselves and the uh, wrongins the wrongins <laughs> and uh and uh and yeah it's like oh that puts you that puts the world to right. That does like the hairs on the to... chest. Woo! Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. So where did the where did the when did the conversation with music come into this? Because it was great reading the, you know, reading. I've been watching loads of interviews with you today as well, just talking about how the kind of the rhythm and 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 how playlists and stuff played a big part in terms of creating this. Really, if that's fair. Well, well, me and James, we we're like really really old friends. We go back way back. Um, James hasn't worked in films before now, but we like we we went you know to school together and stuff. And we've been in like bands of all kinds of sorts. We used to have a band called Dillweed, which was our little punk band at school back in the sort of like regeneration of like you know Southern California punks. So we thought we were these like skaters and all this. But we but I've always had this sort of fascination with like 
it's probably I, I miss the whole rave culture because I'm a bit young for it but I like I sort of always had this like fantasist idea of what it was and like people growing up around me like this kind of almost had this like warriors-esque like uh, you know sort of like look about them and they were like doing up all these like sort of like uh, you know fast uh, you know street racer cars and all this kind of thing and I was like what is who are these people and what it was like the last punk movement especially in the northeast and all this kind of thing it was this sort of anarchist rebel movement and um so I knew that with this film I wanted to kind of do that I was like what if it had that kind of score to it but a fictionalized world that's sort of set in like a some weird post-industrial rave culture thing that doesn't really exist but could do like you know like a Walter Hill would have done back in the day with like the Warriors or something like yeah. that so James obviously he works in that industry and and that's when I got in touch with you and was like you know what yeah what? we were like we were so we met like first year of secondary school we mm. struck connection we were in a band we we've made music together still make music together sort of do you mm -hmm. yeah yeah sort of like just fun right yeah like um and i work in electronic music i manage djs and musicians and you know we we kind of went our own ways when we were in our late teens to go and follow those dreams and jamie made a music video for one of my guys about nine or ten years ago um and then, yeah, so my sort of being entrenched in electronic rave, whatever, and then this film idea coming about, like you were telling me about it when it was just a thought, right? Mm. So it came like, well, you, your idea was like these kind of rave analog tones. And then we started talking about if you can like juxtapose that with like traditional contemporary Northeast folk or Scottish borders music or and just started to play around with it. We actually were on a flight to Mexico together um, probably almost two years ago. And we just sat there and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about the film. It's like a nine hour flight. And we took off and it was like, blah, 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 blah. we'd be like, what we can do? Blah, blah, blah. And then we landed, it's like nine hours. We was like, shall I send you the script? I was like, I don't think you need to, mate. I think we've- <laughs> He's like, no, we don't, not, not if it takes me nine hours to read it. <laughs> I was like, you couldn't have read it in an hour. I don't know why it took me nine hours to explain it to him. <laughs> and then a playlist kind of started and it was like, what about this, what about that? And we started with like, it started way more folky. Mm, it did. Um, Like we were kind of listening to the unthanks and, and people like that and like, you know, um, and like really traditional Northumbrian stuff. Oh, Gordon's in there though. Yeah, we have. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's my granddad's band. That one. That's so that's uh, his band. So that was, and I always wanted to start with a piece of folk, and it was like it was sort of Jack once he collects that thing, leaving that well behind almost, yeah. you know. And so we obviously lean, lean into the next genre of the film in a way. Well, yeah. that was one thing I wanted to ask about when you were thinking about those because having these conversations about music so early on is really interesting and how they can form so many things whether it's narratively or emotionally or uh or character you know kind of exploration but how the music fitted you know fitted a scene in terms of were mm. you did you have music there when you were writing that it helped with that and then also how much of that then ended up in the film you know in terms of having it there as an inspiration but then it following right through to ending up being you know part of the final film really yeah, lo loads of it. Um, and that was starting right from the beginning when I was writing, you know, I was putting lists of songs together that I knew would kind of fit. The thing with Jack Doe, I always wanted it to be like every time he enters into like a new scene, because I knew it was going to be this linear journey. That's almost like a level of a sort of a game or something. He's like leveling up each time and we get to meet a new characters when we meet like Eddie at the gym, for example. You know, and we use like, well, I mean, you you the one that got Robin S. You know, that was like that, uh, that kind of thing. That's like... It's like about 25 minutes in and it's there's it's so intense the the film up until that point and yeah. it's like it's very serious and it's not like it breaks the fourth wall but that moment it, it wings it, at you that it, track yeah it's like the film is and it's like it's, yeah. you see those like got those pumped up like max uber masculine the uber man 
it's like you know, but it's but then it's like late. Korea soap. Korea, yeah, yeah. Like they're literally oiled, and it's like I mean, it just that moment should make you laugh, and that's one of the thing I sort of you know keep trying to remind people, and, and with with American audiences, like maybe they don't get some of the nods to that, especially that northeast, or just generally just like Rust Belt town sort of weightlifting like nineties thing, but it's like. This film is not to be massively taken seriously at any point. It is playing into these cliches. And that's that, you know, in that track. And there's a few other needle drops like that. That whole But it also becomes diegetic and it's hilarious that they are in there listening to it. hundred <laughs> percent. It's, it's yeah. a and I know every man in there that's working out of that gym from that era will love that piece of music as well. <laughs> it's going to be like a proper crowd pleaser with like that sort of like X River 90s like guy at the gym. Yeah, yeah, the guy at the gym's kind of in a kind of weird sort of um state of kind of hybrid working out hybrid in the club. You know, that kind oh, of like but, they, they, but gym sort of become that in a way, haven't they? They've become like the new club. You know, yeah. and it's in that sense, like that that track does that. And then, you know, for example, other tracks where I was kind of like unsure but listened to quite a lot of pieces was um the track Tingler, um, who which is like si Silas's warehouse music, and that's like yeah. I said to James, I was like, "What? You know, when you go to like a rave and it's got like multiple rooms, and there's the room that you shouldn't go in, and you're like, I'm gonna go in there anyway and see what it's like." I think they did in Peep Show, like when he's like, yeah, just yeah, hear yeah. the music coming out. It's even too much for super hands. It's yeah, too yeah. Much for, <laughs> if it's too much for super hands, then it's the right. That's the right yeah, genre for that. And I was like, you just as soon as you go in there, you're like, I wish I didn't come in here. <laughs> but you have to check it out. So that that and Jim sent a whole bunch of stuff. He's like, oh, I know some real wrong and tracks. That I went to a really dark place trying to find that the right track. <laughs> <laughs> how how was this for you, James? Because you know, Jimmy mentioned in terms of you know you've got such a great and really successful career in 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 the kind of different fields that you've been in leading up to this point, with music being kind of that kind of circular thing in and around it all always the music but this is another part of it for you you know working and connecting film with music what was it I don't know what was it was it was it exciting did it feel different did it feel like a new thing or I think like um they always used to say about like um in the 90s they'd say that rappers wanted to be basketball players and basketball players wanted to be rappers right <laughs> And I feel like if you work in, I can't speak for people that work in film, but if you work in music, you're just fascinated by film. And it feels like, but that's the real superstars. <laughs> Whereas people in film are like, but they're the real rock stars, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, you work in music, as you know, and it's like the rock star thing's great, but actually there's a load of like, oh God, this person, you've got to do that, do it. And of course, I'd now see behind the curtain, it's exactly the fucking same. You know? It's yeah. like... Of course it is. It's like, isn't it wonderful? We can put any music in this film. It's like, no, we can't. We've got a tiny budget. And the thing we want, you can't do that. So you need to find something that's the same but different. And all and all of that. And I think I what was good is like, I mean, Jamie's trusted me in doing it. We talked about it from the beginning. Um it's it's a great honor to to have fun doing it. But I didn't come into it with the baggage, I suppose, that film productions have mm -hmm. and like because yeah. it's true. quite transient that wore, you, that wore you down quite quickly once you know, i'm getting the bag we start around. picking up the baggage it's like really why is but but at the same time i was i suppose i came into it like hey guys just so you know i don't know what i'm doing i think this is a really good idea and if you say listen i don't know what i'm doing people can't be like why don't you know what you're doing so I think that was why we ended up with such a good sound compiled soundtrack and some of the artists we got, like, you know, even I have an AFX twin on there and stuff. It's like that I that I just sent that track to James Strickland. I was like, Polynormal C, I love that piece of music. I love the AFX twin. And he was like, AFX twin doesn't really give his music out to anybody, like for yeah. films. It's really hard to get in touch with. And then that was the first piece we got back. He was like, he's totally fine with it. It's great. And I was yeah. like, but I think it was sort of like your ignorance is bliss a little bit with it, with the film. Well, I think thing. it's also like also, you must like garner a fair, a fair amount of respect, you know, with your experience. So, you know, you're coming from that side of music as well, you know, you know and managing it, people. You... I think it's like we get a lot of sync requests, right? So I know how to be on the other side of it, you know. Yeah. And my first job when I was 16 was in a record shop. So I know what it's like to buy a record and then sell a record and, then, and carry on. So if you know how to talk to someone and say, <laughs> hey, Mr. Quinn, like, <laughs> this is really good because of this. Or, or then you go to Liam Howlett and you're like, hey, but this, 
but then adamant you do, you do it in a different way because you're <laughs> yeah, sort of yeah like, yeah and um I love you the know. fact that all those artists are in the same movie as well. The ones all you did. Well, well, yeah. But like, you know, um I it's a bit like radio plugging, which you'll know all about. The people who are good pluggers know how to work the angles, you know? And um yeah. so I suppose it's a bit of that. Um but yeah, that it's, it's great. It's something I definitely have enjoyed doing, and it's. Um, but yeah, like I said at the beginning about sort of people in music and film, it's like yes, yeah, total dream. What a brilliant thing to be able to do, you know. And Jamie, you've got this wonderful background as well in sound engineering because the kind of the the soundscape of the film, you know, not just the kind of needle drops as well, but score, and then also the sound design on it is just extraordinary. There's not, you know, there are films that you watch that you don't kind of come away thinking. Oh man, there, there's a really a lot of thought put in at this the sound design on that for it to be part of the storytelling, and you definitely get that with Jack Daw in terms of how important those things are to to uh, emotion, to kind of you know sort of thoughts, internalization, all that kind of stuff. I think. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it, thank you. It was such a big part of it for me to obviously with that being my background to you know, make this film really sonically pleasing and exciting. And and I think from the, the start of making Jackdaw, like I was always like, I wanted this film to feel like really loud and uh, obnoxious at times and punky. And w there was a really w interesting turning point with that where you kind of like, you push it so far in the production of the sound that we were like two days away from kind of signing off the mix. And um, we did we did a screening and I was like, something's different about this film. And it was like right at the last minute and everything was like working brilliantly at that moment and it just got to this final sort of like we're nearly signing it off thing and it's just been polished too far and that was a really interesting thing for me to not that I've not realized stuff like that before when you end up making something too clean or whatever it be it sounded too professional actually and I was like it's gone too almost too Hollywoody that it took yeah. away some of the character of the film and like some of the some of the jokes weren't even landing with like with, with Tommy Turgus's character and things like that so okay. actually, at the last minute, we had to. I was like, "What's what's happened?" And then um, I was like, "I was like, guys, you've made it like too good." I was like, "Can we go back and make it like scrub it up a little bit and and take it back?" And that and that was even with the way we were filming it and stuff. That was always something like really important to me to kind of keep that sort of B movie punky edge to it. Like I didn't want it to feel like too polished. Although I wanted it to feel heightened in in many ways, not to feel too polished as well. Uh, and that's such a fine balance where you could have like, if I hadn't known how to communicate that, and and that's probably the benefit of having the sound background that I had, mm -hmm. that you could really get in a pickle at that last minute as like a director or something, or you're just about to release your movie and you're like, don't quite know what's not right about it. But, you know, it's only 5% different, but I think it probably made quite a big difference to how the film would have felt. So that, yeah, that was like, uh, it was a really interesting learning experience for me that, with that. It's almost that thing when you kind of, you know, if you like go out and it's windy and you kind of think you know how windy it is and then you like turn the corner and you get absolutely battered by kind of it being, it's kind of that that sort of... That, the umbrella that, turns upside down. It was one of those moments, yeah, it's it, 100%. It, <laughs> it's got that, the kind of raw elements kind of feel so kind of beautifully heightened in it as well. So you kind of get a real sensual experience with a film. I think it was trying to not make it feel too um, naturalistic as well, because, you know, with these kind of films, like I said to you earlier, like this film's not to be taken massively seriously at all. Yeah. And I really don't want to do. And I think when people try to do that, they get the wrong idea of what I was trying to do with this film. I'm I'm sort of making fun of the genre a little bit. And that might even be like the superhero genre at times. And, you know, sometimes it becomes a buddy comedy. And, and the reason why I kept that sound really quite like cheeky all the way through, even if it's like big, you know, guttural stabs or like, like motorbikes. just two, 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 like, yeah, motorbikes or yeah, exactly. And and those sounds remind you that you're in a slightly heightened reality. It's not yeah. to be taken seriously, you know. So funny you mentioned genre because I always get so excited when you can't put something in one genre and you can't with this film because for me it kind of falls into a number. And I hope you take that as a compliment. No, I do, I really do, and I'm really glad that you know. And I don't know if that's a good thing sometimes, like whether. And I mean, but I 100% set out to do that. And even when I was writing it, I was going, you know, I got to the Tommy Turgus character, and I was like, I think it's become like a buddy comedy, like a buddy comedy now. And it's like, and I was like, yeah, it totally has, and I want it to. And then you know, and it, and it, it goes from a thriller to a buddy comedy. It's got like a romance sort of through line going there, and it's 
and I, and I was sort of having fun with that myself, just being like, why don't I just try this? Because I've done so many different bits and pieces in the TV that I've done. I'm like, why not chuck a bunch of different stuff? And people's attention spans these days, it's not a bad shout to try. It's quite interesting like, when you're like, when I'm saying about reaching out to people and how to, it, when you're, when you can't show them. Yeah. And you think, well, okay, well, it's, it's like, can I get on the phone, please? Because it's like, I just need to like... Describe this movie. And everybody just thinks, oh, it's a gritty British... Yeah. And it's like, no, it's not that. No. If anything, it's like... If anything, I'm sort of like having fun at that genre. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, Abs- Tony Scott or, or Walter Hill or, or even, you know, those are the those are the kind of films that I loved and growing up and I feel like there's a lack of them being made. And I'm like, well, if you could sort of do one of them in a small town in England... And you know where you don't quite know where you are and stuff, you know. Well, it's the same with the way Shane did so much stuff as well. You know, talk much talking about Tom Turgus, you know, as well, like the This Is England lot. They were, I mean, they were dark as hell, but they were absolutely hilarious as well. You know, and they were romantic comedies at times as well. You know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. kind of it was, um, and oh my god, I love watching Tom on screen. He's just ah. <laughs> uh... Oh, I mean, well, so he, when I was writing that character, I, I wrote it sort of a bit generically and I knew he was the jester, you know, at that at that point coming in the story to disrupt Jack's night big time. And um, and uh, I sent it off to a casting uh, like agent and they were like, what about Tommy Turgut? It's like, obviously for this character. And I was like, oh my God, that's such a good idea. And once I had that, and I know, you know, and, and also for me, like I was such a big fan of Tommy, like from Northern cinema, just growing up and being so inspired by Shane's films and stuff. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, to get him in sort of a nod to like that, those films that Shane made, but also in a slightly more like cheeky heightened kind of way as well. And he was really keen to do that. You know, he was like, he was like, I I, I want to do like a Northern superhero like, action thriller movie. I was like, yeah, it's all those things. And uh, yeah. so that, that, you know, but once I had his voice in my head, it was so fun to write that character because I was yeah. just writing it, knowing exactly how, you know, he was riffing bits as well, but he, he, um, yeah, he was like, yeah, this sounds like what I would say. And I'm like, I know. And what about Silas as well? Because I imagine that was a fun character to write as well. What a character. Yeah, I mean, he's he's like, I know Joe Blakemore who played him for ages and uh, I've always, I just want to do everything with him and I do use him in loads of stuff. He's genuinely from Newcastle. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of TV stuff together. In fact, the first show I ever did, like, uh, did Vera with Brenda Blethyn, and he was like the baddie in that. And I think I've probably had this idea to use him as that kind of character since then. And he's always had that long hair. And like, literally, just before I shot Jack Doyle, he like had to shave his hair off for another role for this Raoul Moat thing. And I was like, no, Joe. So we got him like the <laughs> best wig ever in the world. Like, we spend the entire budget of the film to get his old hair back. Um, yeah, and he, so I knew Joe's voice. And Joe, for me, encapsulates like so many people that I met growing up. He's not like that yeah. himself, but like in the northeast of these kind of characters, who you're like, that guy is unhinged, but he's also like really charismatic and interesting. Him. You know, he actually sees through the veneer of it, like everyone else. He's, he's probably the smartest guy in the town, but he's also like the lunatic that you'd absolutely be terrified of. And you know, and and, and also like being a sort of heightened baddie as well. Like he is, the, he's he's definitely a slightly eighties eighties baddie as well. And but yeah, it was such a fun. I mean, yeah, I just loved writing and everything I do with Joe, especially in this film. It's just so much fun. I couldn't believe how quick the turnaround was on it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the you kind of hand in the first draft of the script August twenty twenty two, and then yeah, it that's... was, and then it was kind of what like eight weeks, and then to shoot to prep and it's like that's amazing it's i mean it's really yeah and we terrifying were shocked. i imagine it, i mean it was totally well it was the, the the producer who sort of took the took the chance and he was like have you got any scripts that are sort of in this round you know and, and i was like well i do have something that i'm sort of always been trying to work on i got around to finally writing it when he he sort of started showing interest and a week later i delivered him a script but i wrote the script in that you know like you said i was listening to this like i was listening to prodigy's experience album like pretty much mm-hmm. start to pitch as well which is like you know, like you see, listen to that, you feel like you've been on a night out. And by the end, I finished writing. I wouldn't want to put the laptop down. I'd be like, I want to know what. Because I didn't sort of necessarily plot the movie out, but I wanted to write it like that. You know, those books I used to get where you sort of turn to pitch 25 if you want this to happen, or put turn to pitch 50. If you want this. So I was literally sort of going, oh, what would he do next if he was here? And that was helpful looking out my window. Um, but I think probably the hardest thing, like you actually getting the tracks cleared in time was like, I mean, I mean, that was, I mean, really? to, I think to, to answer the question on filming though was like, 
three weeks? I shot yeah, I shot it in twenty day, twenty days the film. So it was like with we, Christmas in the middle. Yeah, we had snow and minus twelve. It was. And I, I don't think that I don't think it's ever been that cold in the North Sea. So it was minus twelve, right? and everyone was like, "You can't put Oliver Jackson coin in the North Sea in in winter." I was like, "I, I won't be that bad." <laughs> he did get hypothermia, and uh, but he's fine. Oh he's fine. He didn't lose any fingers. It's fine. So he's yeah, great. But, yeah, he's, he's great. I mean, you know, there's 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 a lot asked of him, not least throwing him in the North Sea at minus twelve, but just the kind of the almost the unspoken nature of the character in a way, you know, the, the what's not said from him, but how you learn about his story and the character through his performance and with a helmet on as well. And I, I heard you talking about The Mandalorian, which I <laughs> I, I bloody love that show. And yeah, and, and the music on that is amazing. Ludwig Gornson's a, an yeah, absolute amazing. legend. But um, but it was really interesting hearing you say that. But it's, it's and then am I, am I right in thinking that he, you had to kind of convince him that he could, he could, he could do the role? Yeah, I mean, big time. He was like, he was like, he's a strapping, like, working class northern guy, you know, like like me. I'm sort of like a bit posh from London, and like, you know, and, uh, and I was like, look, but he's, he, but all, I could see the look in him straight away, and I and and I knew he's a great actor, and I'd seen you know a few bits of his work, and then I like delved right in to look at a lot, a lot more of his stuff. And for me, it was like Ollie was perfect for the role for the reason that I wanted to again what you said about sound earlier. It was just like a little bit louder and a little bit more heightened than usual and you know ollie brings that sort of hollywood glamour to the role that you wouldn't normally expect with that kind of character but still totally fits in he doesn't not look like he would yeah. have been a, you know a soldier from a town and all that but it's like again what would tony scott have done in the 90s to cast that kind of character and it's like you know you could go the the obvious gritty british thing dead man shoes yeah, which I love and I love all those films, but it's like that, but that was what we were sort of trying, you know, I had exactly the same with Jenna, like trying to convince her. It's like she brings this sort of glamour to the role that I, I, you know, she was like, you need someone like really gypsy and like dirty. And I'm like, yeah, kind of, but also it's like that, but with a bit of like Hollywood sort of <laughs> near on top, you know, so you can't quite figure it out. But that's really good though, because on the other side of that, you're giving them something, giving them an opportunity to do something that most people wouldn't really kind of, give them in a way I, I totally and that was what that always is what interests me and then it's like you know I think there is it seems as there's, there's a bit of lazy casting going on these days I think and it's sort of like you know and that's probably always been the case people get typecast and you know I I would use I, I mean I know a lot, a lot of actors up north like Joe and stuff and I'm really glad I could get Joe in this movie because you have to convince people yeah I want I wanted I would you know, I hopefully I'll get my career to a point where I can be more adventurous with casting generally. And that's what really interests me. It's like subverting people into those roles is like, that excites me. And it's like, you know, exactly the reason. And actors will be the first people to cast everyone else except themselves for the role. And that's when you sort of, often that's the quality you're looking for in them. If, if an actor does that, they're like someone you probably want to work with because they're quite humble and <laughs> don't think they can do the part, which is often when they can do something really interesting with the part. But I think that's been a really good thing that's come through quite a lot of the work you've done on TV as well. And I don't know if you've been involved in casting on stuff like that as well, but even in like, you know, His Dark Materials, I thought the casting on that was fantastic, you know, in terms of there were so many unknowns within that. But it, the, And you kind of, you know, weirdly like in your head from reading the books, you were going, I knew that's what she looked like. Or I knew, mm. you know, it was kind of, it was just really, I just thought it was really, really clever as well. And, and it gives you kind of, it gives you license, I think, to when you see people in different, either you see people that you know in different roles that you've never seen them in before or do something different or you see completely new people. It takes you in the story quicker. It takes you into that that place, I think, as well. Ah, uh, Well, that's really good to hear. And I, I hope that's the case. And I feel really happy with all the choices uh, that we made. And I think we were really lucky to get the cast we got and especially in the time we had and you know, and they come and work on this movie with like against all odds without any notice and stuff. So I think we we, we looked out big time and really pleased with who we had. James, who was that kind of squeaky bum moment with the with the the music clearance then in terms of you know that that time ticking away and you're like, oh my God, please email me back. Uh, I think the question is who wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> uh no, I, I tell I know and it, it's it was uh, it was Adam Ant. Um, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Frontier yeah. Um, uh, which, but I would say, James, you have to get this piece oh, of music. I love, I love, and it's a sort of piece of music I've hounded James with for years because that comes from my mum, 
totally and my mum at christmas will put on like records and stuff and that that album has always come out at christmas and we've got like a, an old record player but it's got like loads of bass to it and you know those drums that start at the beginning and they're just so warm and analog I think that was the only track there's there's the only track where you were like yeah no it has to be this <laughs> you were like, like typical i was <laughs> like okay does everyone know where adam Anthony is because everything was all clear like the you know the master it's yeah. like half of the writing and it was like adam Ant's, I, 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 we don't know but uh, also you know the uh deadly avenger and cy Beg, who who composed the score yeah they were so like it was like, oh, they were like to the to the like last minute two weeks yeah i think they scored the whole thing in like less than two weeks and it's wow like, okay we this is i mean this is a new this was new to a lot of people in, on this film and it's like right okay what is the most efficient way of doing this through um, WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, WhatsApp. Uh, what's WhatsApp that group. It's not politics, it doesn't. No one else in it apart from you, me, and those guys. Um, I mean, and even, and even that was too many opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but what were the asks then? What were the conversations with them? Because, you know, the, the, there, there is this fantastic mix of music, you know, that's, that's not a genre. There are lots of different things in there. But in terms of the ask of them and also that sound design that we were talking about, you know, and for the for the score and what they were creating to for there to be a connective tissue between that. How, what were the conversations that you had with them about what you were looking for? I think, I think the first the first thing was that I was like, because Jamie was like really pushing for analogy, ravey tones and atmosphere, uh, yeah. as well as the industrial folky northeast stuff. And it was like, well, how, like, rather than getting a film composer, score, classical, whatever, to try and do the ravey thing, yeah. it's like, let's go to the ravey people and put it on a film. And I suppose that was where I was a bit more like, no, it's, you know, and also, you know, we can't get the, uh, you know, this, all the people that we think are amazing at scores, like, we can't get them. So, and then, can you do it in you know, two weeks? Right? No. So it's like, well, I mean, the first person I thought was Deadly Avenger. Yeah, he kept saying it, and and it because he he they came from that world, so I kind of introduced them, mm. and then Jamie was very much, you know, you were yeah. Well, right. we just bounce and you give your opinions on the piece of music, and it, it was try even just in the time that we had to put the film together, trying to co collaborate with the sound designers and the composers so that they didn't cross over too much, but also were working together. Even just organizing that in the time is hard, um, mm. and but like my thing to James was, I mean, pretty much the main brief to them was like. Can you, you know, like if you listen to like an electronic dance track that goes on for like, let's say an hour in this case, it's like you want it to feel like it's rising. It's pe it's got all the peaks and troughs in the right place, but it all kind of feels like the same piece of music. And I probably have bombarded the film with music, but I just got excited and I wanted, I just kept being like, you know what, let's just keep it going. And, you know, and finishing with that Jericho track with the, the credits at the end, the bright credits, it's like, I want people to feel like they've sort of been to a rave by the end of the movie, when they walk out the cinema. Um, so it was like, can you guys do that? Bring in some tones of like, you know, that that era. And I, I would always use the term rave to James. And he's like, there's loads of terms. And I'm like, yeah, but it just that, I'm, it's a fictional thing I'm talking about. The fictional rave uh, world that I imagined as a child. And but also with like really spooky, dreamy, like atmospheric, mm. weirdy stuff in there as well. Um, and if I think that was it, it was almost like if it didn't feel like it was a dream in a dream, yeah, it didn't feel right. Like the whole yeah. night back should feel like this weird nightmare. So it had yeah. to have that sort of eerie tones to it as well. I think the Gaelic element as well is yeah. really amazing, and especially it's with the dad, we both sort of grown up with. And Cybeg's daughter Cass has done some vocals on there, which she did the sort of Celtic vocals. Haunting. Yeah, 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 exactly. For well, that end piece of music with um, you know, with the showdown kind of thing, that was like we yeah. brought in. We use small pipes as well. So like not bagpipes, small pipes, because it was like a bit Northumbrian, a little bit yeah. more Northumbria. Uh, yeah, so it was like mixing those things and the guys did it really well. It's like, can you do rave mixed with folk, mixed with Celtic, <laughs> like haunting vocals? And yeah, they pulled, pulled yeah. it off. Well. Smashed it, smashed it. And then Sam Fender on top of all of it as well. I was just, I was just about to say, we do need to give our shouts and props out to Sam Fender. Talking like, about, yeah. you know, um, industrial folky Northeast romantic yeah. yeah all that it's kind of he's just um yeah i mean i i kind of think he feels like he's he's one of those kind of people that 
I don't know, he's been here before. Do you know what I mean? He's kind of, he's, uh, yeah. he's, he's got, uh, oh, he's an old soul, isn't he? Just in terms yeah, of like, oh my around. God, yeah. I well, think it, I think, I mean, thinking about. It, 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 I mean yeah. you wouldn't be able to say this. I like, I feel like Jamie and him are, are quite similar in a way. Like they're, they're from the Northeast. They, everything they do is bleeding the Northeast. Um, it's the, it, you know, the fact that they're both still living up there as far as I'm aware. They're both, because I, I reached out to them and I was like, well, okay, Jimmy Nail, okay, Sting. Uh, like, like, <laughs> so, They'll do a Mexican like, collaboration. <laughs> so, but it's like, got in touch and I was, I was talking with um, his manager who's super helpful. And I was like, again, it's that, can you get on the phone and just listen yeah. to me for minutes? Yeah. And he, and he was telling me, Owen was telling me that these guys just sound like they're kind of kindred spirits. And um, Sam was so into it that he actually sent us a folder of music. He's yeah, like, and here's a load of yeah. stuff that I've recorded as demos, just me on a mic. Let us know. Wow. I'm into I'm into what you're doing. And yeah. Iris just, I mean, I'm actually getting goosebumps. Just, it's just yeah. incredible. It's about... And it brings it back again for the last piece of music to sort of bring it back to the folk thing that it started with and it's yeah. like he's sort of resolved his issues in, in some way and we use the character. whole track you know we yeah from start to finish the whole track and then you get slapped around the face by jericho the project, by the project. Project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah just when he thought all the music was over yeah, yeah. Um, what did you give him yeah. did, did he did he get a script had you i mean where were you when 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 he came on we he hasn't seen the film or anything. Like no, that. no, he has, hasn't seen the film. Wow, he hasn't seen the clip. No, <laughs> we invited yeah. him to the premiere in the northeast. Uh, yeah, have, have we? Have you done that good? Yeah, <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> um, yeah I'm really hoping. No, I've wanted to meet him for ages anyway. Because like, I mean, I literally live on the Hartlepool coastline, and I think he's in Tynemouth, which is like the next bit up. So we're literally mm -hmm. like living on the coast, seafront houses, doing the same thing, like not sort of like never leaving the northeast behind and like trying to do stuff. And obviously he's he's done amazing stuff. But uh, yeah, so it's just like an obvious choice. Like, will will Sam Fender do a track for the film? And it's like, and it, he pretty much did. I mean, he'd already recorded that track, but it's not really been released anywhere or anything. So it's like, you know, the first place yeah. people will hear it. It's, it's about, uh, uh, I believe it's about uh, Having a night out. Family, <laughs> family member who's died, like yeah. his great aunt. You know, it's all about Jack's yeah. brother's mother, and you know, it's just like yeah. It fit really well. And I was like, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is perfect. And we didn't necessarily expect it to fit there in the in the film, and we sort of dropped it on that bit, and we were like, that works really, really well. Mm -hmm. Like, the door, finally, the lights come up, like the dawn has broken, and this song sort of makes you feel a bit safe again. Yeah, it's perfect. It really, really is. Um, how have you found the, your first film? Jamie, making your first film. I, Just having a moment I, to think about it. I love, I loved it, Edith, and it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it was such a fast thing that happened because I fit it in between two jobs as well. That was the, the <laughs> mad thing. I knew I had, I knew I had Sandman season two coming up. And oh, I can't wait for it. By the way, can't wait. Oh, can't we're wait. filming. I'm filming tomorrow. So <laughs> bloody <laughs> hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're back up. We've we've been filming for a few weeks now. We're all back back after the strikes, which has been great. It's, um, mm. really, really fun stuff. We're loving it uh genuinely and we've, we're sort of like picking up where we left off but like we've learned new tricks and stuff from what didn't didn't work season one so mm -hmm. yeah it's really fun going back in but i was i it kept getting pushed because of strikes and all that business and i was like oh, could it, could i fit a film in i was like but if we go back that'd be a problem and we managed to fit it in so it's you know i just finished doing willow for lucasfilm before and then had a bit of time off and got a bit bored like sitting around sort of waiting to do something and then mm -hmm. the, just magically managed to cram this film in and it was it was great because it was like going back to the northeast doing it with crews I'd worked with on my first drama and stuff up there years ago, all come back to do it. And it felt we were bootleg, you know, we were really doing it like run and gun style, but trying to make it feel bigger. And it's like, but everyone put the effort in to do that. And it was that that was amazing. Go from like doing big network television to go back and like really go a proper indie, which is what I always thought I'd just be doing for my whole life, to be honest with you. Um, and I'd be happy to do that in a way. And I think I'll probably always do that in between other projects. Like, uh, you know, and I want to keep features or at least do a feature at that level, like continuously for myself to go back to like, you know, it's it's a totally different like skill set yeah. as well. You know what I mean? Making a film that way versus making a big studio film uh, or studio, sorry, sure, whatever. Yeah. So I, I loved it. I, I really loved it. I'm dying to do another one like straight away. Um, can I ask a really geeky question? Um, when you worked on Willow, did you get to go to Skywalker Ranch? 
I didn't, unfortunately, no. But I did meet Kathleen Kennedy at many times and got like a two hour and a half conversation uh, where I had to pitch all of my ideas on the show, like all of my big sequences. And she just gave me like her feedback based off like every anecdote she had with Spielberg. So for me, I was just like, I can't actually believe this is happening. And, and in fact, what actually happened the first day, I was the second day, she was up doing Indiana Jones at the same time shooting there. And I was sitting in my... Or, or this little office which was like a porter shed thing on the studio uh back lot because because i was sort of like the last director to turn up because i did the last block so there's like no space for me and they're like there's, there's a porter loo down there you can sit in and the first i think the first or second day i was there they were like kathleen kennedy's coming to meet you and you're off and i was like she's coming to meet me i can't you know so she she literally came and popped her head in and said hello and i was like i was, like, I was literally like seven years old watching et like oh in, man you know, and I'm working for Luke. I mean, I got the script. It was written by George Lucas. It had my name on the front. And I'm like, I had to pinch myself, like, properly. Oh, get that framed, surely. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, surely, surely yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and... we weren't allowed to them out, actually. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out. Kathleen, if Every... you listen. Everything disintegrates <laughs> as you leave the building, apart from you. Yeah, honestly, I disintegrated nearly by the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's James, what... Any... James, what about you? I, I mean, is this the start of, you know, this being part of your kind of, you know your your repertoire now in terms of that getting into that that film world from the other side and and have you enjoyed it? Do you want to do more music supervising? I mean, it's more uh, than music yeah, supervising. I think, um, I'd love to do it more of it. I think like doing it with your pal when yeah. like we that's do I want to like do I want to suddenly like divert? No, but like if the right thing comes along, I know that sounds very like oh I'll do it. It's the right thing. I don't mean it like that. It's like you know, I'm doing it for the for the experience and the love, but um, doing stuff with James is great. But there's, you know, when you're in a band, it's like, and you're playing, many times we would, we had these moments where you'd be practicing my garage, right? And I'll be on bass and he'd be uh, with, the, with the two front men in a shitty little band. <laughs> we're playing. Hey, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> and, you, you know, you're riffing and you sort of do that thing where you look at each other and you just know. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, that's the chord progression. And you have it when you play football with people. It's like, I've played with that guy so much that I know he's making that run. You know, my whole pal Joe, even if we haven't played for 20 years, I know where he's going. I know where he is now. <laughs> uh, it's like, he's offside. Uh, it, and it's like, uh, so we would have that where it's like, yeah, I know yeah. it's, you know, know it sounds cheesy, but ending each yeah. other's sentences. And if it's that, I heard you talking. But, who were you talking to? Uh, who were you talking to? And they said they they met someone in a record store and gave him some advice about. Um, it was Cameron. like Power Records. Was it James Cameron? Oh no, it's Michael Mann. Michael Mann. Michael, Michael Mann. Mann. Yeah, yeah, Michael Mann, the guy that lives in Nova Scotia. That yeah. Yeah, that's right. and and it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy, he got it. Yeah, well, when I heard Mike Mann say that, I was like, that's my James yeah. May. <laughs> like, he's that guy. So it's like I can't that, keep up. that <laughs> thing of like, well, I'm not going to stop talking to that guy in Nova Scotia because he, he gets it. Yeah. And it's not about, it's as much about connecting as it is about knowledge. But to answer your actual question, it's like what I think in COVID, a lot of things happened. And I, I, I'd gone through a bit of a period of just the life stuff being a bit upside down. And I was like, I do love my job. It's, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to work in music and you know that's all great but it's like you get to a point when you're like okay I've completed this level and I need to do something else and it's not about like ego or money it's about mm. just scratching the itch of creativity and once you start once you're like if you're a creative person but you you're working behind the scenes you have to do it I mean in COVID well, we started like doing all sorts of mad stuff. I started a thing called Zomia where we used to just paint yellow squares on random things around the place, That's like in, 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 in the countryside. We, to, we, we didn't vandalize anything, I promise. But, you know, just um, old like, brick wall ideas of like just pretty out there stuff. Just to see what happened. And really. yeah. <laughs> Make, like, making other bits of music. And this but, is one of the things, it's chaos magic, but, really. But it also actually answers the question that you asked a minute ago, where it's like, you know, what was it like making a film versus making TV? And it's like, that's what it felt like making a film again, with people I really knew and really loved. It was like, you know, I, I, it was exactly that. It was like we were working as like a symbiotic unit. And it was yeah. it was the same as working for... Well, you have it with Baldy, don't you? Yeah, I have it with my cinematographer, with Baldy, who's amazing. And it's like, we have the same thing. We don't need to really talk. We just sort of grunt at each other a little bit. And he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> he's like, I know, don't tell me your predictable thing because I already know what you're about to say. And I'm like, okay, good. 
good as long as we don't have to communicate so that's why it's different for making a big studio thing where it's like different people everyone's great but you know what i mean it's like they're not your yeah. friends like when you make a small film yeah and you're not you're making a with your mates and you'd sort of get each other and that's fun well listen i've kept you way longer than i said i was going to thanks so much and i'm sorry about that quick question is iris available is iris out yet then because i'm i'm being joe wiley next week on the radio and i'm like oh it'd be a really good way of a playing it on the radio and talking about the film so um we get back to you on that. Um, well, you get, well, you let Matt know. Yeah, let Matt know and let yeah, me know. Yeah, I will let you know. And it's a good question. And it's something that is being asked. I kind if of not, half... If not, I'll play Adam and the Ants. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, <laughs> no, I mean, if, if we can get, uh, you know, he's he's very major labelled up. Of so, course, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll for sure let, get back Will you that. ask and let me know? Because that would That'd be, be great to kind of, you know, it gives me an opportunity to talk about the film. Um, Thanks, that would be amazing. So yeah, no, absolutely. Easy done, easy done. Um, this is so great to chat to you both and congratulations. And I'm so excited to see what's next, you know, in, in both in terms of you know, next season of Sandman, but also the film world for you, Jamie, as well, and this collaboration and these relationships that that no doubt you'll take along the way to uh, to continue this this wonderful storytelling that you're doing. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Edith. Honestly, Thanks, it means so much. And enjoy the premiere. I will do. Thank yeah. you. You sound friendly. You can play a Dillweed record. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll dust up the old demo. Yeah, dust up. Send me, send me one of yours and we'll go. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right. Take care. Lovely chat to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Matt. Thanks.